Okay. So welcome, bienvenue and miigwech to the October 27th presentation of the Historical Society of Ottawa with tonight's topic, Grandpa Jack, British Home Child. Tonight's uh, speaker is Emma Kent, uh, who will talk about her family ties to the movement about a century ago to find homes across the Commonwealth for orphan children in the UK and for children of poor families. Uh, if you've been attending our HSO meetings since we've been broadcasting by way of Zoom, uh, you'll remember Emma. She was a guest speaker way back in January where she talked about Camp uh, Woolsey. Emma's a graduate of Carleton University with a BA in history. And you can visit her website at emkent 67 wixsitecom Don't worry about writing that down. I will post it uh, in the chat in a few minutes. <laughs> but you can check her website. A lot of great history there and some updates on her previous talk. Uh, at the time Emma spoke about Kent Woolsey, she was a stranger to most of us, uh, but we were so impressed with her meeting, uh, with her presentation, I should say, that we, uh, the board of the HSO asked Emma if she would join the board, which she accepted. And uh, that's exciting because she's added some youth and some uh, fresh ideas uh, to our board. And I can assure you that we've been keeping her busy uh, ever since she's joined our board. Uh, and so maybe that's a question I'll ask tonight, uh, and that is how she managed to find time to ever uh, do tonight's presentation and research for it, given how busy we've been keeping her. But with that in mind, will you please welcome our guest speaker tonight, Emma Kent. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and then we can get started. So, in 2011, the Canadian British Home Child website estimated that 10% of the Canadian population were descendants of the home children, and many are unaware of the heritage. Growing up, I don't think I understood that this part of Canadian history was my own family history. I knew my dad's dad, my grandpa Jack, was English, but it wasn't until I read the book Dear Canada, Orphan at My Doorstep, which is a fictional tale of a family in Guelph receiving a home child that my dad really started to open up and talk to him, talk to me about my grandpa's story. I think this was with the first time I heard the term home children and I don't remember learning more about them until about university. This is how I remember my grandfather. One of these photos were taken to a on a family trip to 1930s Fur Museum. And I fondly remember going on family fishing trips where he would come along to watch, read and tell stories. My brothers and I loved exploring his house because I don't really think he ever got rid of anything. In 2007, he still had the fridge he bought in the 1950s running in his kitchen. Five TVs in the basement and about 10,000 books. Before my grandfather passed away in 2007 at the age of 91 or 96, he spent a couple months using a tape recorder to record his early memories of coming to Canada and being a home child on the Hooker's family farm in Quebec. We're very lucky to still have some of those tapes and my, mo my mom spent hours typing out those stories. Today, I want to use his memories to help tell you his story. Now, while working with his memories, I try to keep these two guiding questions in mind to help me through this project. And those questions were, can I rebuild a connection to a family member who has passed away from the memories? And the second is, as someone who is receiving these stories, how do I best honor them and where do I pass them along to next? It's estimated around 100,000 or more British children were resettled in Canada between 1846 and 1948, or what was then called the Assistant Juvenile Immigration Program, or what Canadians would call home children. These children were usually between the ages of seven and 14, but could be anywhere from six months to 18 years old. About 70% of these children were settled in Ontario through different British juvenile 
see homes. And the other 30% was spread out Quebec, Manitoba, British, uh, British children's future was expected to be limited to do poverty than being orphans or born into the lower class, a better life for in Canada. Canada was also trying to increase the population at the time. So Canada saw the value of bringing over British immigrants and the Canadian government felt that these children would grow up as Canadians and knowing Canadian culture. The attraction to Canadians families who signed up for the program was as a way to add children to the family either as a member or a source of labor. Jack Edward Kent was born on June 1st, 1911 in Surrey, England. He was the eldest child of Edward Homer and Elise Jane Kent. On the left is a photo of his mother and a place where we think they lived. My dad believes the family was well off and Jack's grandfather may have been a chemist. Jack attended the English boarding school at King Edward in Whitney and normally would have gone on to further education. My mom believed he may have had a spot to already secured to Cambridge or Oxford University. Like I mentioned before, Jack loved books and was naturally gifted. While at school, he won a couple of awards, one in divination and another in schoolwork. At King Edward, schoolwork was reserved for the brightest students, and normal pupils would have only had study or trade. At the time Jack attended King Edward's, the school was almost entirely funded by his own charitable organizations um, to help educate the homeless apprentices of the London Gills before opening up to children who had lost one or both of their parents in 1867. One of the ways the foundation gained its funding and still does was by donations of the City of London's lively companies, which is why students learned their trade in the hopes that they would become apprentices and join the living companies after leaving school. According to Jack's school records, he studied metal and workshop, woodshop. This photo of Jack and his classmates was taken on a sports day in 1927. It appears at some point that someone circled Jack, and although faint, this is how I found him after zooming in on my laptop. And that's a photo of him on the bottom of the screen. Unfortunately, we think that when Jack's father passed away, his will was written in such a way that tied the family's money up. And while Jack and his mother, while well, Jack's mother and sister could continue to leave to live a comfortable life in England, there was no provisions made um, for additional education for Jack or his younger brother Bruce. It was decided that given the trouble in post First World War England, that the best thing to do with the boys was to send them off to the colonies or to the immigration home. Now, most children admitted to these homes in England came from the poorest working class families. Often they were undernourished, hungry, and neglected. There's a misconception that most of these children were orphans, but less than 5% were true orphans. Most had one or both parents alive. Often there was just a lack of money and public social support available for their families. And families and parents or relatives had to choose whether to admit these children to the immigration homes instead of the workhouse, have them fall onto the street or have them fall into prostitution. Jack's memory. Well, possibly the first thing I should say is how I came to Canada. I was in boarding school in the south of England. My eyes were bad and I was told to get on the land. So my mother came down to the school and said, there's nothing here for you in England. Maybe you should go to Australia. Well, I said, Bob Christian, my best friend, he's thinking of going to New Zealand. Maybe I should go too. So it was agreed. The headmaster took me down to London. We filled out the paperwork. The time came and I left school. I went to Hadley, the Sally Ann farm in Exus. And I have to talk about Hadley. It was a very pleasant place. And for a while, we heard the New Zealand rep was coming. Good, I'm happy. Today I'm here 
tomorrow I'm going to New Zealand. We lined up and he said, I'll have that one. That one's okay. Oh, don't want him. He wears glasses. They said to me, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go home or do you want to go to Canada? I said, I'll go to Canada. And that's how long it took. Once in the immigration homes, the children will receive good food and new clothes and some social training in hopes of once they arrived in Canada, they would look like a well-groomed, a group of well-groomed school children. These homes were often in urban areas or cities with very little space to keep a garden. If possible, children would visit a farm to learn about animals. Most agencies would try to keep the children for less, for a few months, um, but less than a year to, hope, to avoid them from becoming too institutionalized. The goal was that the children would leave with some education before they arrived in Canada. Boys would learn about farming and girls would learn skills needed in the home. However, due to the great difference of British and Canadian farming, most of these skills ended up being useless. So after Jack graduated from King Edwards, he was sent to the Salvation Army training farm at the Henley Colony in the north of England to learn about farming for a few months. His best friend at the time, Bob Christian, decided that they would like to go to New Zealand. But when the New Zealand rep came by to select the boys, Jack was rejected because he wore glasses. So both he and Bob decided to come to Canada instead. And this was where that photo was taken. Jack's memory. On May 1st, I went to Hindley. We were given a little idea of farming, but very little. Most of what we learned was done with a hoe. I think the Salvation Army used these big gardens to grow fruits and vegetables for London. We had a day here and there with the animals. I remember one day I spent with the sheep. It was on the long sloping road leading down to the sea, and I was told to make sure the sheep didn't get into the salt monsters or it would kill the lambs. I spent the whole day chasing sheep, and I had all the sheep I ever wanted to see. We spent a day here with the horses and a couple days with the cattle, but nothing was of really any use to anyone, shall we say, once we got to the colonies. Even the horse-drawn vehicles were different. In Canada, we used teams. There, they had one horse in front of the other. Jack's memory. I left off earlier when I said I would go to Canada. Well, time moved on and we were finally gone a train in London and we had to head towards Liverpool where the ship was leaving for Canada. I don't really remember how now, but I passed the immigration and I passed the doctor's exam we loaded on the ship and we set sail. Jack came over to Canada on the Montclair, a Canadian Pacific liner, which is shown on screen from an old postcard. Sometimes the British and Canadian government would cover the cost of travel for the home children. And other times it was a different juvenile immigration agencies. Often children would be packed with a bag or a truck for the new life. Once in Canada, the children were sent to different receiving homes across the country until farmers came to pick them up or they were sent to the destination. Children could also be returned to the receiving home if there was problems and assigned to another farm. Jack's memory. We arrived in Quebec. There we eventually went through customs, etc., and we were put on a train and eventually got to Montreal to a hostel there. We spent the night at the hostel and walked around a bit on Sunday. We were all corrugated in a large room and the farmers were up on the balcony looking around and saying, I'll take that one. That one looks good to me. We were never introduced to anyone, of course. Unfortunately, we know that Bob and Jack ended up at different farms, but they exchanged letters for a time that my Aunt Gail found were sorting through Jack's things. Home children were in demand, and it said for every home child sent, there were at least seven applications. Mm -hmm. Families who took on home children had to sign a contract that required the child be housed, 
fed, clothed, and sent to school. A small fee was paid for fostering younger children, and older children would help with chores, and more extensive farm labor would require adolescence. At 18, the child would be discharged. Once placed, younger children often called their new family members, mama, papa, aunt, or uncle, and older children who had joined the workforce of a farm would call them miss, mister, um, and master. Some children did find loving homes, but others were not so lucky. Some agencies would make yearly visits to check in on the welfare of the child and see if the contract was being upheld, but this had little effect. Jack's memory. We got there and I was introduced to Earl and his wife. And as I said, I later found out they had only been married two or three weeks. And Earl took me around and showed me the barn and yard and things like that. And we had a meal and he said, well, Jack, it's time for you to go and get the cows. And I looked kind of stupid. He said that in the back field, I went to the back field and it was a good thing the cows knew the way home because I didn't. I brought them back and I watched them. They all fell into their own stalls. Earl and Vina did the milking, which I was soon to learn and do. After, the, after when the milking was finished, Earl said it was a nice night. Let's go and pile a little hay. He went out and started piling the hay and I got a fork and I was trying miserably to help. And we went on till about nine o'clock. That was the end of my first day in Canada, the first of many, many. Jack found himself at the age of 16 on the Hooker's family farm in Olmstown, Quebec. And this is a street view off of Google Earth. His first day of work was June, July 12, 1927. Jack's memory. Once again, there were strange things for me to learn. And as I said, Earl and Vina had only been married a short time and I couldn't have hit a better farm because many of the boys who came out with me for the Sally Inn and others ended up in horrendous things. I was always treated like one of the families and except as I casually mentioned, there was one time where Earl's brother-in-law accused me of talking too much because he and I could talk in the same level. Otherwise, I said, I was treated like one of the families. And of course, once I got into reading science fiction books, I was quite happy at meal times to sit in the corner of the table and read. I read and read all I could at that time. It's now recognized that many of these home children experienced physical and sexual abuse and the slave-like working conditions all had to deal with the hardship of coming to a new country in, into a new life, far away from their families and homes. Siblings were separated. Girls not only had to assist farm lights with house and child work, but often had to work in the fields as well. Boys who became farm workers were grossly overworked and many were moved from one farm to another. Some children ran away. Some died from ill health or injuries resulting from neglect or abuse, some committed suicide, and some simply disappeared. A few even enlisted in the war as a way to get away from the Canadian life and back to the home in England, even if they had to lie about their ages. Home children is a Canadian term, is rarely seen in newspaper and reports, but used in everyday speech. The term arose because most of the children went from an immigration agency home um, in Britain to a receiving home in Canada. The term was first seen in print in 1924 um, in a report commissioned by the British government to check in on the welfare of British youth in Canada. The report states that the term was regularly used, but some settler families seemed to dislike it. Another term to describe used to describe some of these children were Bernardo children or the Bernardo boys. Thomas John Bernardo was a key figure in getting the home yeah. child project off the ground. Many education homes in Canada use Bernardo children. In Ontario, there was one in Hamilton, Peterborough, um, and 
Its Canadian headquarters was in Toronto. The 1924 report doesn't believe home children was used as a derogatory term, but our articles I read believe that due to the rise of eugenics in Canada, that the British youth were often seen as inferior to the Canadian counterparts. The home children were often stigmatized because of the poor background and made to feel ashamed of it, which caused many to hide their backgrounds, even into adulthood. Jack was lucky. He had a lot of fond memories of the firm. He liked the family and they treated him well. He had books to read and he enjoyed the projects he took on, like replanting trees by the house, raising foxes for the fur, or collecting maple sap to sugar off into syrup, which is a love I also share. Jack's memory. The first time I went to Montreal after being on the farm for about a year was when I got word that my brother, my brother Bruce was sailing for Canada. So I made arrangements to go to Montreal to, to the same hostel where I first came. So I got down there and I went to meet him, but he wasn't there. Oh no, they said, we never send brothers to the same place. He's gone to Ottawa, a little town, a little village outside Ottawa. Well, not much I can do. And, Jack's memory. And eventually I met my brother for the first time in a couple of years. And it was quite a strange thing because he had come to this place pretty close to Ottawa. And he had come into Ottawa almost every day and had learned things differently. He learned that farming wasn't for him. It took me 10 years to learn that. He got in and he had taken some courses and eventually ended up with a frozen food company. We're not totally sure what Bruce's early life around Ottawa was like, but we do know that Ottawa had one of its own receiving homes called the St. George Home. The building stands just east of Parkdale Avenue, across the street from the old Grace Hospital. The building had been renamed in 1904 after reports of cramped and hazardous living conditions there. This home was the main distribution center for children who were Catholic and many families ended up in Quebec. Since a large percent of Ontarios were Protestants at the time, this is what happened to the maternal grandfather, uh, Gilles uh, Dupuy, the former leader of Bloc Quebecois and leader of the opposition. Jack left the firm after staying for about 10 years. As farming just wasn't for him. Um, in 1937, he and a friend cycled to Ottawa um, on their way to the mines in Northern Ontario where they planned to get jobs. They stopped in Ottawa to stay with Bruce. Bruce talked Jack into staying. Bruce was seeing my great aunt Pansy at the time and Jack took Jack along to the church one day to meet her, her mother, and her sister. Things didn't work out for Bruce and Pansy, but Jack started seeing her oldest sister, who was my grandmother, Violet. They got married, and these are all photos of my grandmother. Jack spent some time working for Clark Dairy, and then for a construction company where he worked for over 50 years, even spending the war years in Canada due to his role. Jack was never very close to his family, and this may have been the separation, or it may have happened anyways. My dad said that even though, um, even though Jack and Bruce lived in the same city, they mainly saw each other at weddings and funerals. Jack would send some letters to his mother back in England. And there were some short phone calls usually around Christmas. His mother originally thought that the boys would come back to England and only spend a few years here in Canada. But given the 1930s economy, this just wasn't possible. 
Jack and Violet went to visit sometime in 1973 for the first time since Jack left as a boy. And Jack's mother passed away sometime in the late 1970s. And my dad isn't sure if they were able to make it back for another visit before she passed. He made more trips to visit his siblings and became fondly remembered by his nieces and nephews over there. The program was largely discontinued in the 1930s, but not entirely terminated until the 1970s. In the following decades, research was done to expose the abuse and hardship of the home children and their families. It wasn't until the late 1990s where the full scope of the Home Child Project was really understood during a preliminary inquest in England. In a total, 150,000 children were sent to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. So what has Canada and other countries done to, to remember these children, which some of us here are descended from? In Australia, these child migrants are part of a much larger group known as the Forgotten Australians, a term the Australian Senate has used to describe the estimated 500,000 children who were brought up in orphanage, children homes, institution, or foster care. In Australia, in, in 2001-2004, the Australian government published two reports where it recognized the need for a public apology. They contacted 400 out of the estimated 7,000 home ch or child migrants for advice. An apology took place in 2009 by British Prime or Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. And a one million pound travel fund was set up by the Australian government for former child migrants to go and visit their family in the UK, which their Australian government later added to. In 2010, the then British Prime Minister Gordon Brown apologized to the home children and seven Canadians traveled to London to hear the apology in Parliament. Brown said the following, to all those former child migrants in the families, to those here with us today and those across the world, to each and every one, I say we are truly sorry. We are sorry that instead of caring for them, this country turned us back. And we are sorry that those voices of these children were all, not always heard. The cries for help was not always heeded. And we are sorry that it's taken so long for this important day to come. And for full and unconditional apology that is justly deserved. As Prime Minister, I will be apologizing on behalf of this nation. Brown said he would meet with former child migrants or home children to listen firsthand to their experiences. The, the Canadian government did things a little differently. In 1998, the Ontario Heritage Trust added a provincial heritage plaque to the home children, to the home children on St. George Home in Ottawa, explaining the history of the children. The following year, the federal government described the immigration of the home children, a natural historic event, and placed a plaque commemorating the event in Stanford, Ontario. These plaques were a great starting point in recognizing this tragic part of Canadian history. However, after the apology done by the Australian government in 2009, the Canadian Immigration Minister, Jason Kennedy, said that there was no need for Canada to apologize and said the following. The issue had not been on the radar here. Unlike Australia, there hasn't been a long-standing interest. The reality here in Canada is we are taking measures to recognize that sad period. But I think there is limited public interest and official government apologies for everything that has ever been unfortunate or a tragic event in our history. So maybe to make up for these statements, the federal government proclaimed 2010 the year of the British home child and the Canada Post released a commemoratory stamp to honor those who were sent to Canada. Lastly, in 2011, Ontario passed the British Home Child Act, which makes September 28th each year British Home Child Day. 
to recognize and honor the contributes of the British home children who established roots in Ontario and the rest of Canada. So the lack of apology in 2009 is wrong on many levels, but the one I want to focus on is when Kennedy said that Canadians aren't interested because clearly the families who were affected want to remember and they are doing a lot to stay connected. There are Facebook groups for families to connect and to share research. There are also a number of TV specials and documentaries online and the Library and Archives Canada has a database for Canadians to search their roots. If you have time, these could be great resources to check out and to learn more. Now, it wasn't until 2017 when the House of Commons passed a motion to recognize the interests of the Canadian home children and recognize their contributions of these children and their descendants within Canada. Jill Doucet uh, has spent the last few years raising awareness for these home children and through petitions and campaigns. He eventually made a personal appeal to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for an official apology by the Canadian government to match what the British and Australian government had done. On the right is a photo of him and his grandfather, who was a home child himself. So did Jack's home child life have it, does Jack's home child life have an impact on my family now? I think so. Education was always extremely important to Jack since he missed out on his. He made sure to leave enough for all his grandkids to try post-secondary. And we never really had a strong connection to England. To me, my family tree on my dad's side starts with Jack. Now, I'm, I'm hoping to try something with you. I want to share the first memory again, but I'm hoping to let Jack tell it himself through a recording he made almost 20 years ago. Well, possibly the first thing I should say, how I came to Canada. I was in a, uh, a boarding school in the south of England. My eyes were bad, I was told to get on the land. So my mother came down to the school and she said, there's nothing in England, maybe you should go to Australia. Well, I said to my uh, Christian, Bob Christian, my best friend, he's thinking of going to New Zealand, maybe I should go too. So uh, it was agreed and my, uh, the headmaster took me down to London and we filled out all the papers time came and I left school and I went to Hadley and Sally Ann uh, Farm in Essex and I'll have to talk about Hadley, you know, it was a very pleasant place. And after a while we heard the New Zealand rep is coming. Good, I'm happy. Today I'm here, tomorrow I'm going to New Zealand. And we line up and he says I'll take that one and that one's okay, don't want him, he wears glasses. They said to me, what do you want to do? Do you want to go home? Or do you want to go to Canada? I said, I'll go to Canada. And that's just how long it took. Uh, I always get a little emotional hearing his voice again. So, Paul, thank you so much for listening to his story. And I'm so glad that he got to share a little bit about it. The question I had at the beginning when I started this project was if I could rebuild a connection to a family member. And since I have tears in my eyes after hearing his voice, I think I, think I was successful. Uh, thank you. Emma, that is, uh, I, we, I'm opening the, the floor to questions here. Uh, everyone, please ask questions. Uh, but I just want to say one comment as we wait for some questions to come in. It's actually amazing that you recorded your grandfather uh, so few people do that. My experience with genealogy is that people love to delve back into the past. They want to find their great grandparents and their great great grandparents yeah. and so on. And they don't realize that what they need to do is talk to the people in their family that are living and not researching the people that are long gone because you'll learn so much more about your past when you talk to those that are living. So 
uh, I, right there, I think that's a lesson for anyone. When everyone's got cell phones with recording devices, talk to your grandparents while they're still around and get these kind of stories. That was amazing. Uh, don't have any questions for you so far, but I wonder if that's because a lot of people don't know much about the home children. How did you find out? Uh, what, like, when did your grandfather first talk about this? Were you, were you young or were you older when you decided to talk about the home movement? Well, first I have to thank my, my mom and my dad because they were the ones who gave Jack the tape recorder and showed him how to use it. Um, and yeah, they were just really, it gave him something to do and it really empowered him in the last year, I think. So I don't know if... Uh, my grandpa talked to me about it, but like what I said is um, I didn't read a lot growing up until I found um, the Warriors books and then the Dear Canada books. And basically the Dear Canada books is the diary of a girl who's living through an important moment of history. And my dad gave me a whole stack of them. And there was one about a family who received home children uh, and I think that's when my dad like first started talking about it and mentioned it um, and I think there was always like little pieces as we went to a farm museum once um, because grandpa Jack had worked on a farm and all that but I think it was much later and when I when he also started recording these memories I think it was a little bit at a time yeah mm -hmm. I remember the first time I, I I hadn't heard anything about the home movement till one day it was purely coincidence. We had been doing research at the one museum I worked at and found out that one of the servants was a home child. It was her. It was uh, Carrie Furs was her name, and we hadn't I had never heard of the phrase home children until that day. And we did a little bit more research. Wouldn't you know that very same night going home, there was the headline in the convenience store right across the street from where they have all the newspapers from all over. And the headline in the one British paper was, uh, Australian Prime Minister apologizes for the home movement. And I'm sure any other day I would have walked past that headline and not even thought about it, except that I'd heard the expression of home children for the yeah. first time that day. <laughs> uh, and was surprised that it was huge news in Australia, that people in Australia uh, really wanted uh, to give an apology. Do you have any, uh, it seems like your grandfather had good news stories about Canada, do you know anything about some of the more negative stories that maybe some of the other home children might have had to go through? Yeah, I've, um, I've to your dad, good. it seems like it's mostly good news, which is really pleasant. <laughs> I've heard some bad stories in yeah, the past, and in Australia. That's one of the things we always talked about in the family is like how lucky Jack was. And that was always um, reinforced that like Jack ended up in a good firm. Uh, the family treated him really well, and that was always reinforced. I have heard of the stories, and there are documentaries online that I think would speak better to it. Um, but I remember even the Dear Canada book, like, did talk, like, it talked about the siblings being separated, um, and like one child ended up in a really good firm and then one, the younger brother ended up in a really, really rough place where he wasn't, um, fed, um, as a punishment and he eventually ran away. But I know there's a number of Facebook groups and I think those could be a really good starting point for those who want to kind of listen to more. Yeah, I'm just seeing a couple of people in chat now. Uh, if you get a chance, take a look at the chat. A couple of people talking about grandparents that came over. Uh, the Bernardo boys, someone saying, yeah, someone just, maybe just someone noticing here, he mentioned that uh, uh, my father, who was a home child, never talked about it until 1989 when I finally figured out and questioned him about it. So yeah, some people, uh, yeah, oddly enough, this Carrie Furs, although I never met her because she was the servant back in 1915 when my, my museum was restored to that period. But uh, the people that hired her as a caretaker later on, they made her part of the family. The one person actually named their grandchild, or rather their child, Carrie, after the father's servant, Carrie Furs, because they loved her. She was uh, such a, uh, an important part of the family. And the other one that worked there was also home child, uh, uh, what was his name now? I can't remember his last name, Horace, Horace Pamplin. Uh, and he ended up dying about 10 days after Vimy Ridge. So he served with the Canadian Expeditionary Forces, but he was a British home child. 
so yeah, that's just odd uh, uh, memories that I have. The one memory that someone did mention to me before is that they had heard that when brothers were sent over, the one organization, I don't remember which one it was, it wasn't the Bernardo Boys, but they wouldn't give the addresses of family members. They, for some reason, they tried to keep them secret. And I noticed you mentioned that Grandpa Jack tried to find your brother when yeah. he moved to Ottawa. Did he have a challenge finding out where his brother was or were they open to giving him that information? Yeah, so at the when he went back to the hostel, the same place that he had arrived, um, he, I think he went with the intention of picking up his brother and like bringing him to the hooker's farm. Um, but he was flat out told like, they don't send brothers to the same place. Like, it's just something they don't do. Um, maybe it was to cut ties, their English ties, and hopefully transition them back. But as we know, like separating children from the homes and communities is never really like mm-hmm. at all possible. Like it's something to avoid if if possible. Grandpa Jack, he was successful though in finding the brother. Oh no, no, he wasn't. He had he oh. stayed in Quebec, um, and then Bruce um, came and to Ottawa and like lived. But um, later on, they found each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so the organization wasn't much of a help and, you know, nah. family members. Yeah, that's, that seems like an odd thing. I wonder why that is. But anyways, uh, well, thanks everyone for joining in tonight. I guess if there's no questions, that must mean everyone's satisfied <laughs> with the presentation. I found it really heartwarming tonight. We get a lot of great, well-researched stories about the past, but Emma, to hear someone talk about a family member and the wonderful historical connection, uh, it was really special tonight. I want to thank you, Emma, and thanks for all the work that you've been doing. Whoops, something else in chat here, obviously. <laughs> there oh, just couple, people saying there, thank you. There are a couple of questions way up there, Richard. Hmm. Are there? Oh, uh, yeah, have, you, have you got them there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I mind, just Jen, don't want to, I can, I can see them. Yeah, please. Want me to read that. one? Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of them says, you mentioned that families applied to receive a child. Do you know if those applications have survived today? So are any of those application papers out there? In That's a good question. Uh, I haven't looked for Jax because we, we spent a lot of time focusing on his school records just because school, his memories of the school were so important to him. But I would assume that the they're still around they might be in the LIC archive because I know they have a whole whole home child section Mm -hmm. that's interesting I had a question (laughs) so I'm I'm wondering if like sometimes it takes one family member to do this amazing research and then all of a sudden like your cousins and and your aunts and uncles are all really into it that did that kind of happen with you like did you kind of start a raindrop in a big bucket of interest in your family Luckily, my family was like always very interested in it. My mom actually just shared, made a comment in chat. Um, It said that Jack was in his 90s when he recorded these stories. He was very aware of how lucky he was to find a good family. And he knew how horrifying some of these conditions were for children. Uh, Jack stayed in contact with the Hooker family for years. After Jack died, I was contacted by a family member who, was a- who I was able to share these stories with. So, but, sorry, I just wanted to share that comment since it was so, so nice. But, um, yeah, we were always, like, very aware. And my brother, Michael's a historian, and my dad's a pretty big history buff. So definitely hist- family history is something that's important to us. But I think since we are now re-listening to these tapes, we're trying to do more to like um, preserve them and like share them and like kind of make sure they go to a good place. Mm-hmm. Well, tonight was the perfect way to, to get things out there. Uh, so thanks again, Emma, so much for uh, for your presentation tonight. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, well, if you're going to keep these kind of <laughs> presentations up with lots of personal memories, we'll be happy to have you back again, I can assure you that. Uh, so thanks. And uh, if that, thanks everyone for joining us tonight for our meeting. And just a reminder that we'll meet again two weeks from tonight on Wednesday, November 10th with uh, Mapping Ottawa's Indigenous Trails with our speakers, Peter Stockdale and Barb Sarazin. So we'll see you two weeks from tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone.